Okay, cool. So it looks like we're live. Um, tonight we are here, or I guess today with time zones, you know, all over the place. But today we are here with Sarah and we're going to talk a little bit about um, her art and her um, approach to working with analog VHS stuff. Um, feel free to ask questions on YouTube or Twitter or Periscope or wherever you are watching from. We can cover whatever you feel like asking. And uh, if you, Sarah, would like to go ahead and introduce yourself and a little bit about your work and your background and uh, give us a taste of where you come from. Sounds good. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm Sarah Zucker, AKA this, at The Sarah Show. Um, I've been at The Sarah Show since I think like 1996. So if it sounds like a screen name that a child would come up with, it's because it is. Um, <laughs> and I just stuck with it. Uh, you may know my work from the crypto art space or from, you know, I've been making digital art since I mean, I don't know how one defines digital art. I guess I've technically been making art for the internet since I was like 12. Um, but you may know me from Tumblr, from, from Instagram, from all over the place. Um, I make what I have come to call digital analog hybrid art. Um, the simplest way to put that is that you may, if you've seen something that looks like it was made with on a VHS tape or on an old TV, um, it may it may have been something of mine. Um, there is, of course, a robust group of people who work with these uh, devices. Um, but I do I do like to think I bring my own my own special sauce to it. Um, one of the little neat little phrases I've come up with is is I like to say I merge cutting edge and obsolete technologies um, <laughs> because you know I'm like I'm like the rest of you. You know I use Creative Suite and and Cinema 4D and I, I you know I'm I'm a I'm a pretty technical person. So of course I'm not like stuck in uh, 1985 despite what my blazer may be telling you um that you know i use all these these very advanced things as well um and i uh like to merge them with these obsolete technologies you know in a lot of ways these things i use are like you know like the camcorder that i tried to steal from my parents through most of my childhood i finally got my hands on i finally have it now and i make my art with it um so, uh, you know, and, and we can get into that. There's a lot of reasons for me behind why I do that. Obviously, aesthetically, it's quite pleasing, especially in this era of very like high def, shiny, uncanny valley type of, of you know, uh, creative work we see out there. Um, it, there is a degree of sort of like, you know, uh, retrenchant like that I'm, <laughs> that I'm, I'm aggressively uh, using these these older devices. Um, a lot of why I do that, I think, is because, um, you know, I view VHS as sort of the last the last physical medium. You know, before we went to DVDs or CDs, which are essentially you know early forms of digital digital medium. Um, so I sort of view it as bringing the physical into the digital, and it allows me to intervene with my, you know, my work that is highly conceptual, I think, it's an aesthetic intervention, right? It's, it's a way of, um, of making the viewer pause and go, well, whoa, what is this? Was this made now? Was this made 30 years ago? You know, um, it's a way, I think, of very intentionally creating that moment of aesthetic arrest and, and forcing you to consider it in a way that's different from, you know, the constant feed of, of images we have washing over us at all times. So that's, that's me. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is like a very um, identifiable aesthetic and almost timeless. I feel like um, if you want to, I guess, talk about a little bit of, um, do you have, or, you know, how did you end up finding your way into VHS art, you know, were you doing, what kind of digital work or analog physical work were you doing before you sort of discovered this uh, merging of VHS technology and like camcorders and all of that into your pieces? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you did all of that or how you came to discover that? 
Sure, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to keep it neat and not like write you a novel. Um, but it really sort of starts with, um, I went to an arts middle school, weirdly enough, like a magnet school in Canton, <laughs> Ohio. Um, fun fact, if you're familiar with the video artist, Ryan Tricartan, I went to middle school with him. He was our student council president like three years <laughs> before I was student council president. So there's like this weird video artist thing there uh, of this middle school I went to. And um, I was an art, you know, I had an, I was an art major at 10 years old. We had majors in, in arts and a visual art major. And I had a, you know, my art teacher was like very much this very like the way I'm sure people in the 20th century felt about the emergence of photography of being like, that's not art. Like she was very much like, if it's not painting, if it's not drawing, it's not art. And I have always been, I love to draw. I've always been like a doodler and someone who, who loves to draw. Um, my handwriting is chicken scratch and my drawing is kind of, you know, adjacent to that. My, my brain moves faster than my hand can move. And <laughs> already at the age of 10, I was so used to working with things like kid picks and like MS paint you know, when I was a kid that I sort of, I've been thinking about this lately that how it's like, wow, we have these certain moments in our life that are like a root of what we do. And we had this project in this art class where uh, my art teacher was like, okay, you have to draw, it was like draw a portrait of yourself. And I asked her if I could use the computer because I wanted to learn Photoshop wow, and cool. the, the school computers had Photoshop and I, you know, I didn't have that at home. And I was like, this is like my scheme of how I'm going to learn Photoshop is I'm gonna, you know, I came up with, I wanna do it this way. And I, as a, as a 10 year old, got this like earful from this woman about art made on a computer is not art. And wow. anyone who tells you that that's art, that is wrong. We're gonna lose all of the fine arts because you kids are so obsessed with computers and that's all you wanna do is use computers. And I, and basically this woman was so like set against the type of art I wanted to make that I, I quit art, I quit. I, I, I switched to be a drama major um, and that my whole life, I've always had this push and pull, you know, I was, I was a theater major in college and, um, and I got a master's degree in screenwriting. So I like to think that now my journey in art, a lot of it is because I, I never chose it as my like profession in those early years. Um, I know so many people who went to art school who have like art school trauma and like never make art again or or feel crippled by that thing we all work through, right? Where for like 10 years, you have to be shitty at it. For 10 years, your you, your abilities like don't live up to your own standards. We, we all go through that. Um, Ira Glass very famously talked about that, that period of time where like you just, you have, you're like, I've been educated to have these incredible standards and I just can't meet them yet. My abilities aren't there yet. So that's a tangent. That's all to say that because I never studied it and never chose it as my academic pursuit, I was always just then, I've just naturally always been a visual artist. It's just, it's what I've done my entire life. And um, so as a teenager, I got very into film photography. And so this this was like the early 2000s. This was when digital photography was everywhere. Everything was, everyone was getting very excited about digital cameras. And I sort of, again, I don't view it as, it's not like that I wanna be retro. That's not what it's really about for me. Though, of course, I understand there are aspects of that, um, that when you choose to use a medium that's outdated, it, a lot, for a lot of people, it's as simple as that's so retro and cool. I think right. for me, again, film photography in the era of the digital was again about that thing for me that's like, I love these concepts that bridge the physical and the, and the virtual. And um, it was particularly, it was a, a movement I got involved in called Lomography, which um, it's actually a, a company I would come to learn. But as a teenager in Ohio, it was like proto social media. You know, this was like a year or two before Facebook they had a website where you would upload, you know, I'd go to the drugstore and get all my photos developed and then I'd scan them or I'd get them on a CD and I'd post them on this website. And I had strangers from all over the world encouraging me, you know, and that feeling of being this sort of enfant terrible of like, of, of this, this photographic fuckery, you know, uh, cause it was all yeah. about, like I was hacking cameras. I was, 
doing double exposures. It was a lot of my photos were out of focus because of the type of cam, you know, I was using point and shoot cameras and my eyes don't fully focus. I have like a crossed <laughs> eye. So it's always for me was like, yeah, of course my photos aren't in focus. My eyes aren't in focus. This is how I see the world. And it was more about, you know, developing this body of work and this, this approach to photography. So that era really lasted like almost a decade. It culminated with me actually going to go work for Lamography. And I, be, you know, as a teenager, I tested cameras for them. They'd send me cameras. I would test them. So to this day, you know, this company still exists. And, and a lot of their cameras, like the Diana camera, my photos are like all, all over that box and all over the packaging. Cause that was kind of the, you know, just like Facebook, it was kind of the, the contract you signed was like by adding these to their site, they can use them. Um, which is fine. You know, it's, it's okay with me. Um, so it, I would say it was around probably around 2010, 2011, a few things happened. I moved to Los Angeles. Um, I, I was living in New York and I briefly lived back at home with my parents in Ohio, which was humbling um, <laughs> to save money, as one must do um, at times. And uh, yeah, it was like film photography got really expensive. And it, it also was just that I was just feeling done with it, you know? And I think this is something all artists should be open to. And it's why I'm always sort of like, I say, you know, right now, what I really focus on is VHS art. It's not always going to be that. It'll shift, you know? Um, because you reach a point where you go, okay, I've, I've said everything there is to say about, about this. Um, so it was really around 2011. I just, the photography naturally gave way to, I was shooting more and more video by then I had an iPhone. That was like a big part of it. And my photography practice just started becoming more of a video practice. I'm just shooting a ton of video all the time. And, um, and yeah, I started doing a lot of like live visuals for bands uh here oh, in los cool. angeles uh and i uh, with a band in chicago for a time when i was when i was in the midwest and um and so it was kind of through that that i started developing a little you know that was also then the rise of instagram and i started developing a little bit more of like a container for myself and an idea for myself of i think i'm a video artist um you know of course i, I studied screenwriting so there's also always been that influence of narrative and theater to it all for me. And that that's really what brought me to Los Angeles and why I'm still in Los Angeles is I work, you know, in the entertainment industry and have uh, always, you know, grandiose aspirations there. So I sort of saw back at back then, and I'm still I'm seeing them getting closer and closer together, you know, when I try to explain to my parents, like, this is the vision of like, I know I have my art practice, and I have my my uh you know writing and entertainment practice and for a very long time they were these very separate things you know even when i was in grad school for writing i had my first gallery show on the lower east side and i invited all my friends from my writing program and they were all like wow you're like an incredible artist and even at that time it was that feeling of right and that's great but i also want to i also am this other thing you know and um so it's it's sort of i, I don't know what to call that sort of the the inherent angst of being multidisciplinarian, you know, that like to be a multidisciplinarian, there's always that push and pull of like, don't recognize me too much as this thing because I get stressed out when you don't recognize <laughs> yeah. me. I'm also this other thing, right? Definitely. Stress, you know, as a non binary person, it's kind of the same thing of like, don't recognize me too much as this gender because I get stressed when you don't see that I'm also in the other. Um, it's that it's just to be a, to be a person who is multifarious. Um, so yeah, I guess it was really just getting more and more into video in 2011 that at a certain point, you know, I started investigating more and more of analog video very specifically. And it's, it's funny that even I sort of forget that I, there were several years there where I really didn't incorporate any analog video. I was working almost entirely with things I was shooting digitally and and you know superimposing them and and doing all kinds of stuff uh, with with digital video, and then you know it's it's the same as people who like are into synthesizers or you know any any type of gear oriented endeavor. Around 2015, I got my first like analog video device, and again I I snatched my my parents' Hi8 camcorder that I had been like 
you know, uh, <laughs> plotting over since I was yeah. a child. I'm like one day that camcorder will be mine. One day you'll let me have that camcorder. <laughs> and uh, and so it, was, it really started with that. Like it was as simple as at the beginning, it was just me messing around with video feedback with this old high eight camcorder. And then I started learning more about analog video. And, you know, these are devices, this is technology that's from my childhood and like earlier. Um, so it's obviously stuff I never really knew how to work with back then, but I also, you know, it is of my time in a certain way. And um, yeah, I just started, it, it, that part of me that played so much with film cameras as a teenager kind of came back in this excitement of, ooh, I can find, learning about these old devices and being like, oh my God, this one will do this to the colors and that one will do that. And and so now I've amassed this. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking off off here because I can hear her like calling to me. My my video station um, that I've built this like command center. You know, I feel like I'm at like the controls of a rocket ship when I'm at it because it's all these buttons and knobs and device and wires. All these things I can plug into each other. Um, so yeah, it was it was around 2015, and I think it's just that that I. Uh, I also quit my last day job in, in 2012 and um, supported myself for a long time uh, teaching screenwriting online and being a script reader, which is something you know you can do uh, at a distance. So people in the crypto art scene might not know that about me. You know, I, I always remind people when they ask me, like, how do, how do you do it? How do you work for yourself? And I go, in a in a terrified manner often like <laughs> you know, often it is terrifying like this notion of making the choice to work for yourself um a i think is certainly not for everybody and uh b it's something that you have to recognize for as much as you have that joy and freedom of days where you're like my day is my own and i can create whatever i want you also have the terror of those days of i have no idea how i'm going to pay rent because I do not have regular income. Um, so that's how I got myself by for a long time as a, as a professional script reader here in Los Angeles. Um, all the while just, you know, having that time being my own, creating containers for myself. Um, one of which was, you know, really developing a robust practice on Instagram. Um, and for a time there, you know, like any of these social platforms, when it starts paying back to you, when you start seeing your work traveling, you're much more incentivized to keep creating it. And so for a good two year span, I was posting, I was doing every days, you know, so to speak, I was posting something new every day. And um, obviously as Instagram has evolved and the algorithm has evolved, <laughs> I don't see that same um, return on my time investment, which I'm sh I know I'm not the only one experiencing that. So, you know, luckily that was that timed out about the same time as my involvement in crypto art in early 2019. And I sort of went, you know, I, I, I'm always going to put my stuff out there for people to enjoy because at the base of it, it's not about the money at the base of it. It is just, I'm the Sarah show. I like to show people what I make, you know, like yeah. I'm still just that like little kid who's like, look what I did. Um, right. You know, uh, but but now it's like more of this harmonious interweaving with like, you know, that it now is something that that supports me and, and provides for me. And so obviously I've seen organically over time that um, my practice has leaned more into crypto art. And now mentioning crypto art, if you want to talk, we have, um, I think, your latest piece here. Yes. If you want to talk a little bit about that, so this is an example of the VHS art that you've been uh, m m talking about and mentioning. And now um, I've heard you call, call it video painting. So mm -hmm. if you want to talk about that and how that applies to this piece and maybe how you led into that with crypto art, um, you can go ahead sure. and talk about that. Yeah, so I joined Super Rare in April of 2019 and um, as may be apparent from you know what I just <laughs> explained about my sort of winding uh, path as an artist, um, I'm always someone who works in a lot of different styles. I'm always experimenting. I'm always like you know looking for um, new ways of doing things for myself. And so you know, in my early days of crypto art, it was really 
the scene was so different then, you know, if you weren't there, it's kind of hard to even convey how different it was compared to now. Like every, it was, in some ways it's easy to romanticize that time, right? Because partly it was just so much less money, like the dollar <laughs> amounts being spent, like, you know, we were all throwing 30 bucks, 40 bucks at each other here and there and selling each other these one of these gorgeous one of one NFTs, you know, and a lot of it was just fellow artists, you know, buying work from each other back then. Um, so in my early days, it was really, I was just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what would stick, you know? And, um, and through that, and, and that's actually something I would, I would uh, recommend to anyone who's getting started with this. I think that the high dollar values or the high fiat values of, um, of, of work moving in the space now can be can be crippling for people, you know, because especially if you're someone with a standing art practice, you go, I want to make a big splash and I want to, I, I need my first piece to sell for a lot of money. And there's a lot of like anxiety, I think that, that people are now prone to in this space that we just, at least I speaking for myself, I just did not have back then. I remember the first time someone offered me 50 bucks and I was like, oh my God, someone's going to give me 50 bucks for my, for this art that I made that I, you know, I did commercial work for many years. So it's not like I didn't, you know, I knew what it was to make money from my art, but it was always like making art that I didn't really want to make, you know, it was like, right. okay, I guess I'll do my style, but I have to do what you want me to do. So, you know, 50 bucks doesn't feel like a lot of money, but when it's for something you made completely from your heart and from your vision, it was like, I don't know, the first time someone bought something from me, that feeling i mean i don't need to tell you i'm sure you know yeah. that like whoa this is life changing like because as a digital artist you know there are so few digital artists who actually can make a living in the fine in the context of fine art um this is changing everything for us this ability to create a digital object out of our art is i mean the, the world has changed for for us um so, yeah, sorry. I remember. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, please <laughs> go ahead. Go. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, my first piece sold for I think like a little over a hundred bucks, uh -huh. and initially I was just making something fun to put on Instagram, but then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna hold off. I'm gonna put this on Rarible, see how it goes. And yeah, when that first sold, I was like, wait, what? Like, I don't have to just make things for free. Like, there is a demand. There's value behind this work. Like, that was very eye opening. And similarly, yeah. I just then put a bunch of different like of you know different types of pieces from like street art to animation you know my 3d stuff my drag mm -hmm. like i just put everything and like saw what um captured an audience right and that you know again that's not true of all the artists in the space i think a lot of people they go this is what i do i do this i do this 3d render style or i do this you know this is my illustration style you know that's great too, and and po more power to them. That's that's a honestly for them. That's a um, a boon that they are coming to the space already with like this is what I do. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, a flaw or a, a drawback for artists like us who are a little more. Look, I do all kinds of stuff. I, that's just advice I would give to people. Don't be afraid to fail don't be afraid to have something not sell because it's a learning <laughs> yeah um, I've definitely, even, yeah i've definitely had a lot of fails trying to figure out like what you know is worth worth uh minting and putting up there and what i guess like sticks um Same. and <laughs> Same. what excited yeah. me about crypto art was that um I saw that you could really make it anything you wanted. So I just wanted to figure out sort of what format I could have as like a ba a good baseline. And then I would be able to figure out how I could incorporate, you know, my painting or screen printing mm -hmm. or, you know, my video art or how, whatever else I wanted to work with, I would incorporate that into this, whatever style of art, I guess, like stuck. So I never quite saw it as like, you know, and I'm sure it's also with you and your VHS art, it's like, you know, I don't only have to do this one thing. I can incorporate other styles into right. what I'm known for. 
right. And yeah, and I mean, to this day, I'm still experimenting. It's I, I, I think of it the same way, you know, as I now follow so many like cryptocurrency people on Twitter, which is the sort of the surprising outcome of this, because I was not interested <laughs> yeah. in like economics or finance. I was a starving artist, you know, like, um, but now that I follow so many crypto people, like, I would say as an artist, just like people say, oh, put, put this percentage of your portfolio in Bitcoin and put this percentage of your portfolio in Ethereum, do the same thing with your art if you're multidisciplinary. Put this percentage, you know, in my case, I put 60% into, um, this is what I was sort of getting to. I've developed certain series. Like I've seen now that I've been doing this for almost two years, certain styles of mine that really travel, that really like people get it the second they see it. At this point, they're used to seeing things like it. And so I don't have to do as much work to explain and contextualize the work to collectors. They see it, they go, oh, that's a video painting by the Sarah show. I understand what that is. I understand the sales record for works like that. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a faster sale, you know? But there's always gonna be part of me. I'm, I'm still always gonna put 40% into, well, what about this other thing I've been cooking yeah. up in the studio that you've never, you've never seen something like this before, you know? It's, it's important to me it's not about pushing myself exactly. It's just, it's part of my creative truth and my creative approach to the world is if I'm not, you know, like a shark, if I'm not swimming forward, I die. If I'm not exploring something new, I get stifled creatively. So there's a satisfaction in going, I can get my video painter out. And I've really, I've spent years now at this point developing this style. So there's not a lot of friction when I go to create. When I sit to create, it's like, oh, I turn this knob, I do this, I do that, I do this thing, I have my animation queued up, ready to go, I get my painter out, and now I can just freely let this vision channel through me as I you know, create this illustration in 16 bits. And, um, and that's beautiful. And I, again, I you obviously create a lot in that way, but then it's equally important to me that I have the creative processes that are almost entirely friction, right? You know, they're almost entirely like heavy mental lifting about like, I have this idea and I have no idea uh, at this moment how I'm going to like create it because there are a hundred different ways I could go about making this vision come to life. You know, I, I have long felt about myself that, you know, if someone asked me what kind of artist I am or what my greatest strength as an artist is, it's my vision, you know? It's, I'm an idea person. That's again, the part of me that is a writer. That's really, I I think if I had to assess my own body of work, why it, people respond to it. I'm not the world's greatest technician. Most of the techniques I learn, it's in service of these ideas I have. It's in service of, I gotta figure out how to do this because I have this right. idea. <laughs> and, and, and half the time you go to do it and you're like, oh, that looks like shit. Like I should probably yeah. do that again. <laughs> like, I should, because I had no idea what I was doing, but I just had to try it. So, um, so yes, to speak to to three wise dogs, this is definitely uh, you know a very um, this is a good example of of what I call my video paintings or VHS video paintings. Um, and as I was kind of saying there, that <sighs> these works are again like so many of my works, this digital analog hybrid, right? So I'm. I'm creating animation digitally. Um, I, you know, I, I have my means of creating this sort of video synthesis uh, on my computer to create, you know, these these video rainbow textures you see, and then I pipe that out into my analog system, you know. And it's like I said, all these different devices I have daisy chained together to get what has now become a very signature look. Um, like I said, I certainly would not purport to be the only person working with VHS. There is a, a fairly robust community of people who work with analog video. Um, but my impression, you know, because I'm I'm very involved in those communities, and and I I don't think I would be um, remiss to say that I, I've really developed my own style and my own look. So just because it's VHS doesn't mean I made it. I I have a certain way that I create work on VHS and a certain um, color palettes that I'm drawn to and uh, a style that I, I'd like to think at this point 
my work is pretty recognizable. Like you wouldn't have to see the name to know, oh yeah, Sarah, Sarah made that one. Um, yeah, and the inspiration for this one, I, I made this last month. Um, I kept thinking about, there's a meme uh, that says Doge, like D-O-G-U-E, like Vogue. And it's oh. a tiny chihuahua swaddled in a blanket. And it looks like the cover of Vogue magazine. And it's it's really just like, um, I really love small dogs. So like, uh, I've never had a chihuahua, but I like love chihuahuas. And <laughs> I I just like identify with them um, because I'm, I'm a highly sensitive person, uh, which essentially it's just, just to say that like, I'm very affected by sensory input. I'm very easily overwhelmed. I'm very, it's why I'm an artist, you know, that I, my calibration on my nervous system is just more sensitive than the average person. So like, uh, like at the beginning of, um, you know, the pandemic and when we were having a lot of protests here in Los Angeles and they were like right outside our door and I was just very aware of, the mass of people and the anger bubbling up. And like, even though I, of course, politically, I support what the protesters were protesting, just on a physical level, I was like, my nervous system is so freaked out by this. Like, because yeah. I'm, I'm, so I got a thunder blanket, like, you know, like, <laughs> you'd use, you, like you'd use for a small dog in a thunderstorm. I got like a weighted blanket that I could sit on the couch and like, oh, cause we also in LA have, um, at 8 p.m. every night, this still is happening. At 8 p.m. every night, people like hoot and holler and bang pots and blow whistles uh, for the healthcare workers. Oh. <laughs> for the healthcare workers. It's really because people are like, yay, a publicly sanctioned time for me to make a lot of fucking noise. And something about it, even though I know, again, of course I support the healthcare workers, but something about it, it's like every time at 8 p.m., my asshole clenches because I'm just like, <laughs> the noise the noise like it's frightening um so i just really identify with this idea of being this like small nervous creature swaddled in a blanket like trying to center yourself and so um in the case of this one i just you know these are three chihuahuas who the center one has obviously like achieved that peaceful place and the other two are like trying to get there um and so, yeah, it's, you know, with a lot of, especially with my illustrations like this, with the video paintings, I have like a running list of ideas, like stuff will come to me, you know, on a walk or in the shower and I write it down. And sometimes I work from that list. And sometimes I just, I sit with the painter and I'm like, what do I feel like drawing today? You know? Um, and it's, again, like I said, that's that, that almost frictionless process I've now created for these video paintings really lets me just get an idea through um, without having to worry about, wait, how do I, what color do I want to make it? Or what, you know, how am I going to get that effect I want? Because at this point, it's like second nature to me to be like, okay, touch this, I push that, I turn that knob, and and now it has that look that I want. Um, yes, so that, that, this one. that's how I, I definitely feel about, um, like, working in the uh creative suite and like making digital art that i feel like i had that discussion the other day and i like i think of it almost as like being fluent in a native language or in a in a foreign language mm -hmm. it's like i just know exactly what i need to do to get what i need to be done like i'm fully wired into this system it's become like a part of me now yeah. it's a part of my identity yeah. You really um, realize that when you have someone ask you how you did something and you're like, I actually couldn't tell you. Oh, it yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> it just comes out of me. I don't know. <laughs> so what you mentioned that you have like a list of ideas. What are some of the ideas you have on your list? I'm very curious. Well, <laughs> given I that we have you, some... they'll be, you know, th this is my no this spoilers. Is like, that's the real, you know, I try to be very transparent as much as I can, but that's the like, you know that's my gold right there. Those are my like, oh, you know, I, that's the work, that's my work list. That's what I'm creating from. And I'm sure, you know, any crypto artist can relate. I've seen people talk about this, that um, now that I'm, now that my work can be monetized in this way, it's like, forget my old practice of posting every day on Instagram. Now I have the opposite problem of like, I create this work. And then because I, I'm not ready to tokenize it yet, or I'm like still waiting on some pieces to sell before I tokenize, you know, whatever it is, I have 
already this pile of like really cool stuff I've made that just like isn't I haven't tokenized, but I also haven't shared. Like it's unusual for right. me because I I used to be so in that mode of like the second I've made it, I share it. You know, be and that's that was a great practice for a long time because it helps you be less precious about your art. So this is something I've come to now where like, you know, this is being a little more precious about the art because you go, Hey, that piece could, could pay my bills next month. I don't want to spoil it on Instagram where Instagram is not even going to show it to anyone anymore. Yeah. Anyway, they sort of de uh, devalued video on their platform. Um, you know, and so you go, you know, as much as I love my Instagram followers, it's like y'all, as RuPaul would say, if if they ain't paying your bills, pay them bitches no mind, you know? Right, right. <laughs> Not to yeah. be so glib about it. Of course, I like, I so appreciate like psychic support is huge, right? Like whether that's following people or engaging with their content, I'm by no means am I saying, am I devaluing that? Because I think that's a huge part of why a lot of us feel empowered and emboldened to do what we do we get positive feedback online you know that's no money is exchanged but that has value to us um it's just to say that right like uh, you know I, I now have come to really value like my ideas are my are my that's everything so as much as i'd love to tell you um i have to i have to keep those a little close to the vest <laughs> it's your little vault of secrets yeah just know but that they're I, very weird and very trippy, <laughs> and um, yeah, they're they're some of them are pretty out there. Some of them I have like notes next to it for myself of like, are you sure? <laughs> like, are you sure <laughs> you can do that? We'll yeah, I'm definitely try. definitely looking forward <laughs> to seeing uh, some more of these crazy ideas from you. Um, I also totally relate to like holding on to a project and not putting it out because I think there's a lot of value in like when you decide to put out put things out and like in what market what mm -hmm. and you know like politics can have a, a an effect on when you put things out oh, yeah. even if it's not a political piece of art um so that's something i definitely took away at least from my time in college so that's all like you were talking about art school and art trauma like i just graduated a year ago so it's all still like pretty fresh in my mm -hmm. mind but Something I definitely learned was like, when you think you've, a piece is like finished, just leave it for a couple of days and then come back, rewatch yeah. it or re, you know, take a look at it again. And then, and then it's finished if you don't have anything else to add or change. Sure. Um, and I think that's something I really appreciate that crypto art has done is kind of not just added value, like monetary value behind pieces, but also made a lot of these, uh, I don't want to say new digital artists, but maybe these uh, people creating digital art that didn't necessarily view their pieces at the same caliber as like a big mural mm -hmm. or something that mm -hmm. needed to have all of this care behind it. But now, you know, people like us are like, oh, well, you know, it's the project is done in After Effects and it's rendered, but I'll come back to it next week and see how it looks. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. I. Yeah, it's been remarkable to me. You know, I I used to curate uh, like a visual music show here in Los Angeles called Prism Pipe. And that's actually, I found crypto art. I found Super Rare through Yura Marone, who was an artist I showed at Prism Pipe. Um, this, so this was like maybe about five years ago. And I've gone on to see a lot of these people, a lot of these artists that are people I was familiar with from this show I used to curate now getting into crypto art. And so that has provided me this sort of like singular basis of comparison of like, you know, back then viewing their work yeah. as a curator and seeing where they were back then. And of course we all grow, we all grow in time. The, the part of it's just, well, five years went by people, people grow as artists, but crypto art is like this fertile ground for exactly <laughs> what you're saying that now it's like, Hey, if you just ran it through an app on your phone, maybe that's not enough, you know? And I, I've, I would, I am not in the camp of people who hate on phone apps. I sort of believe, um, I always say it's the witch, not the wand. You know, I actually have a piece that says it's the witch, not the wand. And that for me extends to my art, to my life, to everything that I, as much as I love my gear, as much as we all love, you know, these toys we get that we can make things with. I think we can all agree. Well, Photoshop didn't make the art. After Effects right. didn't make the art. 
the artist made the art. So I, by that logic, I certainly am not someone who's like, you made that on an app on your phone. That's not art. Yeah. Hey, if, if the concept is there, then maybe, you know, if, if everyone can tell, hey, that's that filter we all have access to and mm -hmm. you just used it and, and you didn't do anything beyond that. Yeah, you might you might get some feedback that indicates to you, you know, do better. Like we expect more. Um, right. So it's just to say that, like, I'm very excited by right. Exactly. This this the addition of the fertilizer that is money. You know, money is yeah. shit is fertilizer like it encourages young things to grow in the words of Hello Dolly. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> it, you know, it's providing this landscape for digital artists to finally take ourselves seriously for once. And, um, and exactly, it's sort of saying, hey, like do better, do more, think more about concept, think more about, uh, you know, how the art exists in the world. Yeah, I think it's kind of full circle in a way, like you started, off talking about how you got into art and how you wanted to get into digital art and you were like yelled at by your teacher and now we're sitting here you know however much later and we're like you know what use your phone to make art you know it doesn't matter like what you're using and um, right that the definitely tool is goes... not the artist the artist is the artist yeah there was actually an effect i needed on a piece that i'm sharing tomorrow that i couldn't get done in after effects so i had to put it through my phone an app on my phone to get the filter to put back into After Effects. Oh, I've, so like there's I've done definitely the yeah. yeah, there's definitely value like, you know, in all these different platforms and all of my pieces I shoot on my phone even. Like I don't have a or I ha I have a DSLR but it doesn't, you know, now it doesn't even get enough quality as my phone or maybe Same. I just know how to use my yeah. phone better but there The iPhone it, is like the greatest art making tool that has been oh, existed absolutely. probably since tempera paint. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. like I said it really catalyzed for me my movement into video art because it's this it, incredible camera and editing tool. It makes things so much more accessible for sure. Mm -hmm. Um and before we wrap things up, there's we also have a second piece. Um, mm -hmm. We talked a lot about your um, like techniques, and you kind of touched on how. Oh, hold on, can I get your profile? Yeah, your uh, you identify with the dogs in the piece, and on, on, almost like a self portrait. But you do have an actual self portrait mm -hmm. um, here still also available on your super rare and mm -hmm. it's definitely clearly you know your style of vhs art but um it's a little bit different and i can see how when uh it it goes back to when you were saying like you want to try and constantly be trying new things i'm i've mm -hmm. noticed this new style of yours evolve mm -hmm. over the past few months and if you want to talk about that a little bit as well yeah i'd love to um so yeah, this definitely fits more into that camp uh, of what I was saying about that uh, you have to be willing to take risks and you have to be willing to try. Um, you don't have to be, you don't have to be anything. <laughs> and, and obviously I think we see in this space how the people who really get rewarded with the money are the people who really are consistent. And, and because this space really, it currently is more about it being collectibles than it is about being art. And I'm not saying that as a pejorative. I'm not saying that even, uh, I don't I don't mean that as a negative. I just mean that as that's what it is, you know? And you have to be honest with yourself as an artist. And um, we all have to always be asking ourselves that question of why am I doing this? Why am I in this? Is this just to make money? Or is this uh, something I see as a component of my art practice, which I do for reasons beyond money? You know, I've been doing this since long before I was making money at doing this. So, and I would say that's, you know, that's probably true for a lot of us. So um, I would, so I, it's not to say all people have to push themselves, but in my case, uh, it's important to me that I take these risks and that I put things out there that um, maybe aren't as recognizable as, as one of my pieces or as clearly defined into one of, into my VHS style. Um, actually, in the case of this piece, this is a, uh, this is does not use VHS at all. Um, this is ties more into that earlier practice of photography that I was talking about. Um, 
that I have been doing stereoscopic photography for over a decade. Um, again, it ties to the fact that like I have one wonky eye. You probably don't notice it. it. She doesn't really like act up unless I'm tired, but it does affect my vision. I actually cannot functionally see depth. Um, it's something I didn't learn until I was like in my 20s that uh, for people like me who have one eye that's funny like that, our brains have an algorithm that creates depth for us. So like I can drive, I can do all kinds of things like that. But when I get tired, you sure will see me walk into a door frame, you know, like, <laughs> I, when I'm tired, all bets are off. Like I cannot tell where things are because that algorithm starts to like malfunction. So I think that's why I got so interested in stereoscopic photography, because um, if for people who are unfamiliar, stereoscopic photography just means any kind of photography that uses two or more lenses to recreate the parallax effect of having two eyes. Uh, it's the foundation of everything 3D, you know? They've been doing stereoscopic photography as long as they've been doing photography. Um, it's like just as old. Um, so for this portrait, uh, this was a stereoscopic photo I took back in, I think last January or February. Um, and I had this idea of how I wanted to process it. Cause usually with stereoscopic photography, you get that wiggle, the wiggle effect, you know, it's just yeah. one, two, one, two, one, two. You're just showing the two photos in succession uh, where you choose a focal point, you know? And so I often choose like in a portrait, the focal point of the nose uh, or the eye or one of the eyes. And, and so then you get that wiggle and you see the background move more than the focal point and you're like, whoa, that's 3D, that's cool. Um, and so I had this new approach that I, I just like, you know, again, it was probably like a shower thought where um, I also work with a technique called slit scanning a lot, which is also like, it's it's like slit scanning is as old as cinema. Like uh, Edward Muybridge, who did like those first videos of like a horse galloping, technically what he was doing was like slit scanning. So slit scanning is just a process of like revealing lines of image uh, sequentially. So, um, if anyone anyone who follows me on on Instagram or anything has seen, I do these videos sometimes where I'm like dancing in my studio and I use slit scanning and it makes it like makes it this really weird, trippy thing, you know. And it's a technique I'm very open about like that's the technique I use. Of course, like any artist, I have my own way of going about it. Um, so I always think it's funny when people will comment on something like that and go, fake, this is fake. And I'm like, it's art. Art, yeah. yeah, art Art means artifice. Of course it's fake. I never, I wasn't trying to tell you that I can actually move in four dimensions like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I, I, I basically back in February I had this idea of, I want to mash these two things up. I want to see what happens with this certain type of stereoscopic photography um, if I combine it with slit scanning. And, and basically what you're seeing here, this wiggle, was the outcome and it was like really exciting for me because it was a total experiment of like and i've since discovered that with a lot of types of stereoscopic photo it doesn't work with a lot in a lot of cases it looks really bad and just like nothing <laughs> but with this particular one i'm still getting that depth effect of like you see the person and you know you see me in the foreground and then you see the background moving like separately but I'm also getting this wobble, this this weird warpy thing. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and yeah. I spent like a month, you know, cowering under a blanket, terrified. And um, you know, I know what's weird about it is I know I did make art in March. Like I, I, a lot of these I've lately been looking at like what I was up to a year ago, and I'm so surprised by these pieces that I released last, last March where I'm like, God, I must have been in like a fugue state or something. Yeah, definitely. Where I see it and I'm like, that was in March. I That feels like it was five years ago. Um, like I was surprised by some of these pieces. I was like, I could have sworn that was in 2019. I can't believe that was like eight months ago. Um, so, you know, this piece that I, this experiment I had done sort of sat untouched for a long time. And then um, I found it in the summer, we were having these terrible wildfires here in Los yeah. Angeles. And it was again, a scenario. So we'd had the protests 
in June. And then it was August. We were having like 115 degree heat. The sky was red. You couldn't breathe the air. My wife and I were hiding with our with our Siamese cat in our bedroom, which is the only room in our house that has air conditioning, uh, you know, hiding with an air conditioner and an air purifier. Um, that was when I bought, uh, uh, thanks to crypto art earnings, I bought an Oculus because oh, and cool. honest, honest to God, I think the Oculus is what got me through without having like a mental health crisis because I was like, it looks like I live in hell. The sky is red. The air is poison. I need to dissociate completely and go to like a <laughs> virtual snowy wonderland. And I was like, you know, doing the Ev Mount Everest experience and things like that in VR. Cause I was like, if I blast the air conditioner at me and completely block out any vision of the red sky, I can just feel like it's not happening. Like sometimes dissociation is just the tool you need to get through <laughs> yeah. your life. Um, so uh, it was around that time that I then did another pass at this portrait um, with a style that I've been working in working with since 2016, and um, I haven't tokenized many pieces of it this year. I was tokenizing a number of works last year where I was combining my stereoscopic photography with um, essentially neural, uh, a type of neural style transfer um, to make them look like 3D paintings. And it was, it was something I'd had quite a bit of success with. I got profiled in um, Vice for it back in 2016. Um, cool. Yeah, it was a, and it was a style that was selling pretty well back in 2019. And um, it's not to say, I don't know, I've prob I probably, I have a ton of these things. Again, speaking of that thing of just the stockpile, I have all these like 3D paintings I've created over this past year. And it's just not what I've felt called to tokenize. You know, I've really, um, I've been leaning into the VHS based work. And uh, I guess this is kind of what I've been talking about all along of like, feeling that sense of like, I work in all these different styles, but you can't deny that it feels good to find success in one of them. So then you kind of have this other style sitting over there and you're like, well, I want to put one of these out. I want to tokenize one of these. But then it's that feeling of I've gone so far down the path of contextualizing myself as a VHS artist for people that if they see one of these, they're not going to have that same experience of instantly recognizing that I created it. Um, so I've just been sitting with all these pieces and I, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do a big show or I'll, I, I don't know what I'll do with them at some point. Um, so I, I use that approach on this piece to create this sort of, this sort of, uh, 3d, uh, painting and I really liked it, but it just sort of, it was again, like with a lot of these 3d paintings I've been working on, I sort of was like, yeah, but I just don't, August was when I started having a ton of success uh, with multiple editions on Rarible, um, which then in turn, of course, like made my super rare market really uh, get a lot of action as well. Um, so I just, you know, it's that when you have those moments where, you're, where your work is hot, you kind of have to listen as much as you want to play the esoteric B-side you have to listen to the audience chanting, like, play the single, you know, play the hit song yeah. we all want to hear. You're like an asshole if you don't give people what they want. Um, so it's all to say that I I rediscovered this piece when I was kind of like, you know, cleaning up my computer last month. You know, I always try to like clean up this mess I've made, you know, every year I, I do yeah. a big cleaning of my computer in December typically. And, and I found this piece and I was like, yeah, this is really cool. And then I, you know, and then there's this other technique I like to use of pixel sorting, um, especially with 3D photography. And, and, and I actually combine it sometimes with my VHS work because um, this, this approach I use to pixel sorting gives, gives the work this texture so that even though it's a digital piece, it, you feel like you could touch it and it would feel like tickly, you know? And, um, and I'm very like, synesthetic like that that I always think yeah. about what image like feels like you know um so I I spent a silly amount of time because it's you know with any of these things like they seem simple but as any artist knows to really dial it in where you want it it can be so fiddly it can be so especially working with things like glitch which by nature is chaotic you're like ah it's so much work to get it just at the level I want it and um, 
So yeah, that was the final pass on this. And that's why I titled it Self-Portrait Through 2020, that I, I felt like the outcome really reflects, like last year did a number on me as it did on yeah. all of us. You know, it was a yeah. wild ride and it warped us. We're all forever warped. I was even this morning talking to my wife Bronwyn about like, I don't know, I was just thinking about how it's like, oh, even once we all start going back and like things start opening up again, I was like, depending on who gets vaccinated and when, like, it's not like there's gonna be a clean moment we all wake up and go, oh, it was all just a dream. Like, we're yeah. gonna be fucked up by COVID for the rest of our lives. So, yeah. Uh, so I don't know, I, I, I think that that's what this piece represents. And, and it does, it actually does exist within a series. Um, my first one ETH sale uh, was my very first piece on known origin, was a single edition that, uh, you know, was, I would say, a, a progenitor of this style. It was a 3D, uh, a 3D painting that I, I used like a pixel sorting uh, a technique on. And it was my first one ETH sale. And at the time it was like, whoa, and it sold like that. And I was like, whoa. Oh. And so then I, and that was at the beginning of 2019. And then I did another, uh, you know, to bookend it at the end of 2019, um, that was collected by Coldy in, in December of 2019. Um, and yeah, and so that was, I think when I first started creating this one, it was my thinking of, oh, this is like a series I'm doing. It's sort of, you know, uh, I, I like to, you know, similar to yourself, like not all of my work contains me, but I certainly find that like my image, my body is one of the greatest tools I have available to me in expressing myself. And I, I really have always um, embraced the modality of self-portraiture. So uh, when I first started working on this one, I was like, yes, this will be my beginning of 2020 self-portrait. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> and, and so it became my end of 2020. Yeah. <laughs> well, it came through really well. It looks really, really great. And um, I think it definitely encapsulates how we all felt throughout the year. And we're glad that it's over. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, if you have anything else you'd like to promote uh, before we wrap this up, you can uh, go ahead and do that. Anything like your socials, your Instagram, your Twitter, super yeah. rare profile. Yes, I am at the Sarah show on almost everything, Twitter, Instagram, um, super rare, uh, and, and all the other platforms. Um, I'm, I'm annoyingly Sarah E. Zucker on Facebook and TikTok is a new thing I'm trying. Yeah, um, you're TikTok. I'm a TikTok now. Um, I'm always going to be someone, you know, I'm going to be like 90 with my cane and walker. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, what are the kids up to? You know, like, it, I like, you know, I always feel like, why complain about it? You know, if you can't yeah. beat them, join them, you know, and it's, I'll admit TikTok is mystifying to me, but as I'm starting to like get the hang of it, I'm like, oh, okay, I get, I get the language of this now. Like, I okay, I have some ideas for this now. Um, yeah, TikTok makes me excited, similar to how crypto art uh, it it provides a lot more agency to, you know, a lot of young creators. I've seen a lot of great video art on uh, mm -hmm. TikTok. So it might not seem like the most artsy platform, but I definitely find a good amount of inspiration there when I am least expecting it. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. I, I finally was convinced that I was like, you know what? You can't just write this thing off. Like you gotta, you gotta pay attention to what the kids are into. Like, they know what's up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Well, um, definitely yeah. be sure. Oh, sorry. Do you have? Oh, anything sorry. Else I was just say? gonna say. Right. I have those two pieces available on Super Rare. Um, I have a very, very cool drop coming to Super Rare that I have planned. Um, probably sometime next month that'll have like a physical component to it. That's oh, exciting. So I, I won't exciting. say any more than that. But um, it's it's going to be a real gem. I'm excited for that. And, um, you know, I have a lot happening in the crypto art space at the moment. So just if you're interested in me and what I do, uh, give me a follow and keep apprised. Yeah, it's definitely worth following you on all the platforms. I'm pretty sure like we're mutuals on everything. And um, I'll be on the lookout for your next pieces on Super Rare. And thanks for 
giving us like a really awesome insight into your work and how you came to work with analog digital art and video art and how you come up with all of your crazy conceptual pieces. And if anybody watching wants to go ahead and follow Super Rare on Twitter um, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can go ahead and do that as well. But I think that's it for tonight's live stream. Thanks for joining us. And um, we'll be live again with another um, spotlight on Tuesday next week. Thanks. And end the broadcast.